Uh, I'd like to call the meeting. I'm sorry. <laughs> you might hear me. I can't hear you. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Please rise and pledge allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. A roll call is Ferrara. Mark Finkel. Here. Albert Hayes. Here. David Burkstead. Here. Jeffrey Rosenthal. Here. Dennis DeWitt. Here. Robert Leslie. Here. Robert Fultan. Here. John Hodgson. Here. Stephanie Rizicki. Here. Richard Ferrara. Here. Mr. Chairman. Good. I need a motion to accept the agenda. Um, we have, um, do we have any additions? We have a couple of contracts to discuss. Already in the agenda. Oh, they're already in the okay. Then uh, a motion to adopt uh, the meeting agenda. I'll make the motion to adopt. Mr. DeWitt. I'll second. Any Mr. further Mr. Discussion? discussion? All in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Any opposed? Um, we have a lot of guests here. Um, and we're going to go right to uh, the public comment period uh, because your time is valuable as well. Uh, the first person on our list is Joe Sullivan. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, I don't worry about these pieces. Just stay at the corner from the table. In the other room down the hall. <laughs> <laughs> Anywhere in front of the camera where we're off. <laughs> Outside the door. <laughs> Thank you for allowing us to uh, come in this morning and state our opposition to the state's idea to shift the burden of paying for the Hudson River Regulating District's uh, operations on the, from the recipients of flood control onto the backs of the permit holders and the, the, the communities surrounding the lake. Uh, as it, most everyone knows, I'm Joe Sullivan. I'm the uh, co-chair of the Sacred Heart Protection Committee, and I'm here today to talk on behalf of the permit holders and uh, the SPC itself and our local communities. Uh, the SPC was formed back when the state tried to uh, take away some of the rights that we enjoy as permit holders. As a community, we, in one year, we've raised well over $150,000, hired lawyers, we challenged the rules. Through our collective voices, Albany uh, heard us loud and clear, and we were able to stop the, uh, the uh, rules. Needed. We recognize the lake is unique. Uh, there's not another one like it in New York State. Uh, and we're reasonable people, and, and we're here today to protect what we have and to protect our interests and our way of life. Uh, and I also want to make sure it's perfectly clear that we understand that this is an Albany-based initiative. This is not coming from the people in this room, the, the administration, or the board of directors. Uh, and I'm, I'm pleased that you're allowing me to make this statement and get it on the record. We're opposed to being considered beneficiaries for financial purposes, and we're, ask, we're here to ask you to consider fighting back against doing another study. It's already been decided in state and federal courts that the district's methodology for assessing and applying costs is fair and appropriate. A new study, in our opinion, would be expensive and impractical, and in the end, it would be a waste of money. There are several legal precedents that support this view. In the Niagara Mohawk Power Court versus Hudson River Black River Regulating District lawsuit, the trial court found that the permit system is legal. It also went on to say that no two permit properties are the same. Permit holders receive no flood benefit protection, and the primary benefit permit holders receive is recreational. Courts have upheld that the methodology used by the district to apportion costs is appropriate. Practically speaking, if a new study, if undertaken, would undoubtedly be expensive and would necessitate a permit-by-permit permit evaluation to ascertain what is ultimately an unquantifiable benefit. Doing another study would not only be inefficient, applying it would be impractical. As far back as the district's lawsuit against the F.J. G. Railroad, the New York State Court of Appeals recognized that it's quote, difficult, if not impossible, to appraise the benefit the lake offers. The court will now observe that regulations of the water was a public good that enhanced public health and safety. Many years later, the city of Albany sued the district 
Again, the court found that the district concluded that flood protection of the communities downstream from the Conklinville Dam constituted the most direct and clearly defined benefit, apart from the headwater benefits resulting in its operations. In the Albany case, the court held that the district's interpretation of applying costs to the five downstream counties was reasonable and should thus be upheld. Furthermore, the DEC has approved the current methodology the district has adopted for apportioning operating and maintenance costs among the five counties. The SPC's position is the district's current methodology is a uniform and even-handed approach that should remain unchanged. This legislation is nothing more than a not so thinly veiled attempt to shift the financial burden from the true beneficiaries back up onto our communities. I'll close by stating these points, and they're all well known to you. Permit holders do not own lakefront property. Courts have held that we enjoy a recreational benefit. A recreational benefit was not contemplated in the originating statute. And frankly, recreational benefits will vary from year to year. Use of the permitted areas are limited by district regulations. The permits that you issue us every year, and we're pleased to have them, are revocable. Any benefit a permit holder realizes could and must be considered only temporary. Courts have noted the administrative impossibility of appropriate assessing recreational benefits on a parcel-by-parcel basis, casting doubt on whether it would be appropriate to even attempt to assess permit holders. Attempting to shift the methodology from flood control to other ill-defined benefits creates an administrative burden that will not only be impossible to manage, but is sure to create inequities and ultimately spawn litigation. The existing methodology is permitted by the statute and has been upheld by the appellate division through our department. Moving forward in a new direction will open up the district to litigation, as has been seen in the past, only on a much wider scale, given the number of properties affected. We're hopeful our statement will give you pause to consider, oppose this legislation, talk to the governor's office, ask him not to sign it, continue to work with the governor, find a way to equitably fund the costs of the district, but don't put it on the back of the local permit holders. We, along with our legal team, will work against the undertaking of this study. We will offer you our support. You've been a great administration to work with, and we look forward to hearing what your thoughts on this are and how we can work together to solve this issue. Thank you for your time this morning. I appreciate it. Thank you. David Smith. I am David Smail, co-chair of the Property Owners Association of the Bay. Today I would like to discuss the proposed comprehensive study regarding the benefits to the regulatory district that would establish the standard methodology for future apportionment. For the past 88 years, the operation of the Hudson River area of the regulatory district has been paid by the downstream beneficiaries as required by New York State conservation law. The cost of the Great Sacandaga Lake permit system has been covered by the permit fees. In justification of the law that requires the beneficiary study, the legislators imply that the lake community has significant financial benefit as a result of the construction of the dam. 
They would have you believe that we have many resorts, hotels, marinas, stores, and restaurants that are benefiting from the existence of the lake. Let us first evaluate this, their assumption by looking at the town of Day. The town, in fact, has only one country store. And it's located on South Shore Road, and half the, the population of the town has to actually leave the town to get to the store. Uh, the rumors are that the store, after many years of operation, will be closing at the end of this season. We have one marina. It provides rental of a few bo boats. boats. Uh, it uh, ha has a gas pump and some slips for, for boat boats. And we have one seasonal RV park, park that has some boat slips and, and swimming area. The town does not have any resorts, hotels, motels, better breakfasts, golf course, or other amusement areas. The Great Sacandaga Lake is a blue collar lake and, and does not have large estates, resorts, or, or waterfront condos. The towns around the Great Sacandaga Lake are largely bedroom and retirement communities. In the town of Day, we have approximately a, a year round uh, population of 835. Uh, during the peak summer season on the weekend, we estimate that the population swells to about 3,000. Of the approximately 3,000 homes within the town, approximately 74% of them are seasonal residents. And those, the owners of the, those properties have a primary residence outside of the town. And about 70% of those, those seasonal residents live within two hours of the, the lake. As, and they usually only come to the lake on the weekends or on a, a summer vacation. As a result, they do their sh shopping before they get to the lake. As a result, several uh, individuals have tried to, to start stores, bars, restaurants uh, in the town during the past 30 years uh, that I've been here. They've all failed. There isn't enough business to, to keep them uh, open. The town today provi provides highway, garbage, and recycling services. The town does not have a police department, a fire department, or EMS. There are no civic centers, senior centers, tourist information centers, schools, shopping areas, or bus or other transportation that you might, might think you would find in a bustling waterfront property uh, community. So who is it that benefits? There is no question that the people find benefit living adjacent to water. Those benefits are personal and vary uh, as people do. In general, the general uh, accepted that the economic value of those benefits is reflected in the real estate property value assigned by the assessor that are established during the sale of the property or similar properties. To the extent that the lakeside values are, are at a premium over the contiguous pro properties, they are taxed more. It should be noted that the seasonal property is, uh, within the town of Bay pay a significantly large portion of the school, town, and county ta taxes and receive fewer benefits due to their limited use of property and, and not having students to attend the, the local schools. The lakeside property values of the Great Sacandaga Lake are much lower than those of Lake George. There are a number of reasons for this. Arguably, the significant reason is the, the value 
difference of the lakeside property owners on the Great Sacandaga Lake don't own lakeside property. They own property adjacent to the lakeside property. The lakeside property is owned by the state of New York. The permit system permits qualified landowners for exclusive use uh, of the designated air areas, but those activities are limited to, to the uh, beach and water activities, such as mooring your bo boat, uh, movable docks, and there is no uh, permanent structures permitted on that property. Permit holders pay an access fee that is designed to support the administration of the permit system. It is not designed to reflect the value of living in the proximity of the water. The value is, that value is reflected in, in the tax bill. It is a nauseous of living adjacent to, to a park. Central Park in New York City, or Central Park in, in Schenectady, or living in the Adirondack State Park. Fees are not charged for proximity. The benefits or detriments are reflected in the real property values. Benefits of the permit system accrue to the regulating district. The regulating district is charged with administering the shoreline of the Great Sacandaga Lake. This land, New York State land, is the land below the taking line. And while the administrating the cost is reflected in the regulating district budget, a large portion of the operating cost is actually borne by the permit holders, who serve as inspectors and maintainers of the land. After uh, the permit system, the operational cost of, of managing the lakefront park property, uh, 125 miles wide, uh, up to 100 yard, yards wide, wide uh, would be substantially greater uh, than the current expenses that the regulating district is currently seeing. Assessing, assessing the order of magnitude of the downstream benefits. The largest category of benefits uh, identified in the Goldman Sullivan 2003 report are the benefits for, for flood protection. I would characterize this, these as negative benefits. They are avoidance of loss. The dollar value of these benefits appear to be an estimate by Gomez as the cost of replacing and repairing facilities damaged by the floods uh, that would have occurred if the dam at Conklinville had not been built. In addition to the loss of avoidance, the negative benefits, uh, the report reflects the existence of positive benefits. Power generation, the most obvious example, but they quantify other, other positive benefits. An example of a downstream positive benefit that was not quantified by Gomez as would be analogous to the real property value enhancement that accrues to the owners of, of waterfront property and their towns and counties uh, because of tax revenues. Before the flood control, very little, if anything, was built in the normal floodplain. Added what, what had been the floodplain is now a uh, developed riverfront property and it has a premium value you, you attributed to, to the waterside property. The positive value you of the reclaimed land and could be assessed by uh, comparing the assessment values of similar land that isn't waterfront. However, the value of the reclaimed land, like the land around the Great Sacramento Lake, is reflected in the, the higher taxes paid <coughs> to surrounding municipalities, towns, counties, and schools. The annual benefit of these properties, like around the Great Sacramento Lake, uh, accrues to the various governments uh, already as taxes paid on real property. Final thoughts. The 
dam at Conklin Dill was built to regulate the level of the Hudson River and it materially affects those uh, levels the whole way down to, to Troy and beyond. The regulation of the river level reflects, uh, affects everything in or on the water or on the waterfront. Hydroelectric power, dispersion of, of sewage, source water for municipal uh, treatment plants, and the construction of luxury condos, homes, and businesses built on, on previous floodplains. The benefit is below the dam at Conklinville towards those uh, accruing to the communities around the Great Sacandaga Lake. Consider a thought process. What would the world look like if we removed the Conklinville Dam tomorrow? The property owners around the Great Sacandaga, it means being adjacent to state land, abutting a free flowing river. To them, that diminishes their personal value or benefit if they prefer, prefer lake living to river living would also certainly significantly diminish their real property value, at, at least in the near term. It, it would equally diminish their, their tax bill, to say nothing uh, to the removal of the need for access fees. The Great Sacandaga Lake County school, schools and, and towns would recognize significant diminished tax revenue and the tax burden would be shifted to property owners who are currently struggling financially. The downstream aim of uh, hydroelectric projects would lose a large portion of the power generating capacity. The biggest loser, EJ West, as, uh, which would lo lose most of, of its head, would probably have to close. The Conklinville Dam, dam was engineered to be a containment dam while the downstream hydroelectric projects uh, run a river and, and ha can't store significant amounts of water upstream. Without the ability to control flood, floods on the river, the flood, flood through, through the hydro pro pro project is subject to seasonal variation of river flow resulting in a significant reduction of power production. These dams provide limited flood protection for the downstream communities and historic floods would return. If the floods return, the real value of the property within the historic floodplain all but disappears along with the, the associated tax revenues accruing to the town, towns, schools, and counties containing those lands. In conclusion, I encourage the, the district not to dust off the, you know, if, if the governor does sign this, this bill, bill, I encourage you not to dust off, off the Gomez-Solomon report, but recognize the fact that the communities around, around the, the lake are financially challenged when compared to the communities that are being at, are asking for financial responsibility to be shifted from them. I ask the board to ensure or the representatives uh, of the lake community have a seat at the table during the development of a new methodology for future assessments. Please ensure that the operating co cost of the regulatory district is paid by those benef beneficiaries who are benefiting the most, i.e. the downstream beneficiaries. And and I, I request you to, to you know, contact the governor and, and have him veto the bill. You know, I, I think if he doesn't sign it, it still, still goes into law. So, so he actually has to veto it. Thank you. Thank you.
but uh, as I look around the room, there's a lot of new faces. And the old faces are probably saying, oh no, he's back. Well, we on the lake do not all have deep pockets. And Pataki started this with raising the permit fees, trying to raise the permit fees absorbently, and Andy and his cronies are probably got the same idea. Right now, my assessment on the land is more than I have in the property. The assessments on the land are absorbent. And we don't own the Hudson River land. It, it belongs to you guys. And sometimes I feel that the assessments should be placed upon the Hudson River, not on the property owners who border the Hudson River. Uh, I'm hoping that you leave the permit fees the way they are. There's a lot of, unless we get a lot of rain, I foresee that this lake is going to be drained again just to protect the salt water coming up the Hudson and contaminating the water supply for the couple of the down screen people. I just hope that you leave the permits the way they are. We cannot we cannot continue to afford increase in our fees, increase in assessments and so on and so forth. Uh, again not all of us have deep pockets, and Andy should be told that. Uh, <clears throat> I hope you consider these permit fees as they are now. Let's not consider raising them. Thank you. Last on my list is uh, Deacon Avery. Good morning. I'm Pete Van Avery. I represent the Bachelorville Bridge Action Committee. The New York State Legislature has treated us with contempt by passing a controversial bill that has the potential to make us official, quote, beneficiaries, quote, of Great Sacandaga Lake. As such, we would end up helping to pay for the regulating district's operations. The lake's 4,700 access permit holders are not the only target. Also in the bullseye are the folks living in surrounding localities like Northville, Mayfield, and Edinburgh. Two-thirds of the lake's water surface falls within Fulton County, so the financial hit would be hardest on one of the poorest countries in the state. Incredibly, this bill passed the legislator, legislature without a single nay vote. It passed the Assembly by 137 to 0, and the Senate by 60 to 0. What happened to the legislators who were supposed to be looking out for our interests? The bill requires the regulating district to, quote, take a fresh look at the localities that are actually benefiting from the lake's operations, unquote, and figure out how to build them. Did the legislators actually read the bill before they voted? I bet if you ask a legislator from the Bronx, say, to locate the lake on a map, his brain would explode. The bill in the section called uh, titled Justification implies that the lake's access permit holders ought to pay more. It's evident that the bill's authors did not understand that the access permit system was established to pay for itself, and its fees are set accordingly. It costs the district nothing. 
Apparently, legislators also think the lake is ringed by million-dollar mansions. There are some real beauties on grants of that, but the lake, a flood control reservoir created in 1930 by damming the Sacandaga River, started life as a working man's paradise. Just down the road from me are several homes built by do-it-yourselfers in the 40s and 50s. I knew those guys back in the day. They're gone now. And this is so, but there's still plenty of folks who have to, who have to script to own a spot on the lake. The Sacandaga Reservoir, and that's the uh, lake's original name, was created to control the waters of the upper Hudson River, preventing floods that ravaged downstream communities like Albany and Troy. It has made possible construction of billions of dollars worth of property on the Hudson's 100-year floodplain. The reservoir's downstream beneficiaries pay most of the regulating district's operating and maintenance costs. Who are they? Well, after years of litigation, we found out they're that they were officially identified as the five counties, all near Rensselaer, Saratoga, Warren, and Washington, plus the state, which owns roads, bridges, and buildings on the floodplain, and hydropower companies, which benefit from a regulated flow of running water. The total value of non state property on the 100 year floodplain in the five counties is a whopping $3.2 billion. That's billion with a capital B. For flood, for flood protection on that uh, property, those counties pay the district a grand total of less less than $3 million annually. That's a winning deal. But they want to pay even less. And so do the state, and so do the hydropower companies. Tough luck for Fulton County. I also wonder how many legislators are aware that one third of the lake's water surface falls in Saratoga County. But gee, as we just noted, it already pays an assessment as a downstream beneficiary. Will the citizens above the dam now be double billed? With the legislators, legislature's ringing endorsement, it's likely that the governor will sign the bill into law. So it's time to push back. Please call them up. Tell them what you think. Get on the record. So speaking personally, with the lack of any major issues agitating the lake community in the past year or so, I've been winding things down. But now I guess it's time, time to start lining things back up. Thank you. Well, that's our list. Uh, is there anybody else who would like to say anything? Uh, I have a very brief statement I'd like to read you. It's very brief. Uh, the current legislation not yet signed asks us to study apportionment of the lake beneficiaries. We know that. This board in previous studies has felt that the downriver beneficiaries, hydro and flood control, are the logical and proper way to apportion these. <coughs> apportion these costs, and the court has upheld that view. And that's how we're going into it. Any uh, statements or questions or uh, um, comments? <coughs> Oh, very good. Then we will move on with our agenda. Um, would you like us to take a five-minute break so people can leave? I mean, you're welcome to stay, but we'll take a, a five-minute break. Does that sound right? Thank you all. Thank you very much. Somebody's on the What? Back. Um, well, we're back in session. Um, and we are at number seven. I need uh, the approval of the June 12, 2018 regular board meeting minutes. We need a motion to that effect? I'll yeah. make that motion. I'll second. second. Uh, any discussion, revisions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Report of the executive director, Mr. Hodge. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My report starts on page 13. Quick update on the new office space in the Albany and Watertown. Not much change from last month. The work is continuing in both offices, and I hope to report in September that we've moved in. Uh, the New York State Naval Militia completed a communications exercise on June 14th at the Mayfield office for the planned exercise scheduled for September 8th. All the district staff participated in the mandatory yearly training covering sexual harassment workplace violence, driver, and driver safety training. Uh, training was held in the Mayfield office with the Albany, 
Watertown and Stillwater offices participating via webinar. After our interview process last week for a maintenance specialist, we have chosen to hire Michael Chase to our team. He will be starting with, uh, with us this Thursday. He brings a great deal of qualification, really, from welding, mechanical troubleshooting, electrical, carpentry, plumbing, and the heavy equipment operator to name a few. He was very impressed with his interview and we're excited to bring him on board. Uh, we have two resolutions today in front of you, one for Dave Ioli to the assistant foreman's position and Anna Tracy to the senior administrative assistant. First, I'll speak for Dave Ioli's resolution. Uh, as you know, I have them somewhere. Oh, okay. Don't. Paper clip on. Thank you. That's all right. I know what the content is. Right. Yeah. Uh, first day, by the way, as you know, Randy Palmatier is retired. Randy was a maintenance woman in the second of the field office. With Randy's retirement, we are looking to promote Dave Iole to assist him. Dave has been with the regulating district for approximately 15 years as a maintenance specialist. Since Randy's retirement, Dave has been running the shop, supervising right now the four interns, and has demonstrated his ability to get the job done. A self motivator and a very hard worker. So that said, I recommend to the board the promotion of Dave Ioli to assistant foreman. Second resolution for Anna Tracy. Are we going to do it together? No, this one's separate. Okay. Um, motion to uh, accept the uh, resolution. I will be happy to make that motion. Mr. Rosen, I'll second it. Mr. Birch, second Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Um, Rick is. Anna Tracy's uh, supervisor, so I'm going to let Rick speak to that resolution around this position. Uh, the position that Anna has is basically uh, the accounting person who reports to me. Uh, she is she's the person who replaced Mary Bob. Uh, that position, I strongly believe, um, given the scope of the responsibilities, which not limited to payroll, accounts payable, or the general ledger, uh, really should be a senior administrative assistant, which was Mary's position. So I'm, you know, something I probably should have done day one, but I certainly want to after her six months, and she has the experience, demonstrated experience, and clearly in the six months that uh, she's been with the district has done a fantastic job. So I'd like to get that that position back to senior, administ uh, senior administrative assistant, and I'd like to just have her start right at the starting rate for that position effective uh, with the July 1 payroll for that period. Um, where, that, where is she currently at? She, she's a, she's step one of the administrative assistant. So the lower administrator role, and she's at step one. So we're going to put her over to senior and start her at the starting position. Are we allowed to do that? Uh, I believe you are. I don't see why not. Are you, are, are you familiar with that? Whether we are or not? Just saw the resolution for the first time this morning. I, I mean, I know once you, you're hired at a certain position and a rate and title, mm -hmm. Right. And you're always subject to the civil service to six month probation. And then once the probation is over, you have that position. So I only, I'm not questioning her qualification. No. I only I question don't. can you do the. I don't see how it's any different than. Things automatically. <clears throat> Considered a promotion? Or yeah, that's, that's, that's the answer. Well, she's promoted from, from one to another right. position. Right. right. Immediately after the basically the same duties. Hmm. 
know we've had trouble with this in the past. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't question qualifications. I question mm -hmm. whether it's authorized, to be honest. Well, and, I, and I certainly don't profess to know the civil service. Well, we're not, it's not a civil service position. It's not a testing position. I mean, I look at it as basically as what is what is that what should that position be? That position, in my mind, is a senior administrative role. I mean, you have someone who is, you know, got access to the district's funds. I don't think it's reasonable uh, from any perspective, whether it's accounting or just in terms of uh, internal control, to have. Somebody paid thirty, whatever. I think she said forty thousand now, uh, and that admin job goes to probably forty-seven to pay that salary. I don't. But I don't. I don't disagree with anything right. factually or substantively that you so articulated. What? So the, the question I have is, <clears throat> when you're a state employee, there are, there is a different layer of requirements. I'm not familiar with that. And, and that's what I'm saying. Neither am I. It's my concern. I, I'll give you, as my grandmother would have said, a for instance. When I was hired and worked for the state, I was hired as the first assistant counsel. And I nonetheless had a six month probationary period. Right. At the end of that, I was already from day one performing responsibilities that were more ascribed to being deputy counsel. I was not promoted to deputy counsel until, I don't know, two or three years into my work. Because there was a, I don't know if it was a prohibition, I mean, it was a gubernatorial appointment, so I understand the dynamics are different. <laughs> But they just couldn't end my probation because I performed my duties satisfactorily mm -hmm. and changed my title, which put me into a different salary promotion or uh, increase rate. So I'm just hearkening back to that, scratching my head whether it's okay for us to do it. We can wait a month. Well, it's, yeah. a, well, it's, it's, if we look at the union agreement, which I think it's the only place that speaks to promotions. I don't. I didn't read anything in there that would preclude anybody being in qualified if they had the, the qualification from going from any position to another position. I. We have yeah. precedent. We had all uh, Sue Visco, Lori McAvoy. Tim, who were all previously administrative assistants, were all promoted to senior administrative assistant, and there was no at 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 the end of their six month probationary period. Or did they well, yeah, they were all here. Certainly, were here more than six months. Yes, you just hit the nail on the head, Rick. There were my, my five five different administrative titles truncated down to one. Everybody who was below the top was raised to the top title. That was a restructuring as opposed to an individual promotion. Thank you. I don't know if it helps, but in the 20 years I've been here, every administrative assistant has come in as a step one or the lowest level, and they all, when they reached the end of their probation, were appointed to something else. Jen Klena, Sue, you know, Mary, Cheryl, they, they all were jumped. It's just something that was allowed because they wanted to hire the person at the entry level. If they proved worthy, they rewarded by jumping steps. It's always, always happened. It's always been okay. I'll go on the record and say I don't know if it's been done and okay. I want to know whether it's authorized under law. That's my concern. And I, and I always defer to my counsel. And if he was unaware of it, I'm going to give my counsel a month. That's my view. Well, 
Joe, do we have a motion? I think it's that it's not on the mayor. Go ahead. It's not that council was unaware of it. The council didn't get the actual resolution. It was mentioned in the city of Seattle. I'm not, I'm not, okay. I'm not pointing the finger. I'm just no, saying I I'm asking for an opinion of council, right. and I think that's incumbent upon me as a board member to rely on. Again, I, this has nothing to do with the merits. This has absolutely nothing to do with. I don't know this individual. No less do I rely on your recommendation, Rip. That I think it's merited. The question I have is, can we do it? That's all. It's a very simple question. Mm -hmm. If we can do it, I'd make the motion in favor. Okay. So what do we want to do? I'm just a board member. Well, the motion. I'm just table. one board Call member. Call the question. Let's see what everybody's doing. Can I just table it to the next meeting to find out? Motion to table it to the next meeting. Remember, that's two months. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second that. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Any abstention? No. Okay. Was that a no vote or no, no, no vote? Yes. No vote. I, I, I don't see a problem with it. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Where are we? I would make it retroactive. I would have no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I have no objection making it retroactive if we can do it. That's all. That uh, completes my report, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Any, any questions? Any comments? Uh, moving on to contracts. Uh, board authorization to conditionally award Conklinville Dam Spillway Exploration Drilling Services. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm glad I can read. <laughs> the uh, the placeholder memorandum was on page 14, but then I, uh, as I indicated in that memo. As soon as we opened the bids yesterday at 11 o'clock, as soon as I could, I would get another e uh, memo to you. We did email them, and then there should be copies at each of your seats. You should have uh, a, memor a memorandum dated uh, July 9th <coughs> concerning the spillway exploration. Uh, if you don't have one, I have another spare. It's a single page with a small table in the uh, lower third. Uh, in any event, the regulating district uh, proposes to conduct uh, concrete and foundation rock sampling at Conklinville in support of our engineering remediation design work. Uh, we requested bids to complete the exploration work. Uh, it was advertised in the state contract reporter on June 15th. Bids were due, as I said, yesterday. Uh, Included in the memo is a summary of the evaluation of the bids. We had actually only received two bids. Uh, we had about 40 firms uh, that received or, or downloaded a copy of our invitation for bids document off of the state contract reporter. Uh, we opened those bids yesterday at 11 a.m. and uh, made a determination of the low bidder consistent with the information for bidders' uh, documents. Uh, the two bids we received, one from Aztec Technologies and the other from Atlantic Testing Laboratories, uh, very fairly greatly. <laughs> yeah. uh, the, the apparent low bid was uh, Atlantic Testing Lab at $282,750. And uh, just for uh, the record, the Aztec Technologies came in at $530,358.90. Um, in any event, um, it appears that Atlantic testing uh, meets the requirements of the submission of bid, and uh, we've determined that the qualifications, they have the qualifications necessary to complete the work. Atlantic testing has worked for us in several occasions. In several of our structures, we've been uh, um, very pleased with their work. Um, they're a very responsible firm and uh, do, do a great, great job drilling and uh, sampling um, in, in subsurface exploration uh, activities. So the district staff recommends conditionally awarding the work to Atlantic Testing Laboratories, seeks board acceptance of the recommendation and authorization to form a contract to complete the work 
and authorization for the interim executive director to execute an agreement in the amount of $282,750. I'd be happy to take any questions if you have any. You answered my question, but you I feel confident that I you am, do work. I am confident, <laughs> yes. You work well, I understand. Yeah. Wow, there. is there any reason for the difference or just... Yeah. Well, a big part of the difference was um, it centered around the mobilization fee. And I, I think without having gone into great discussions with Aztec, because it, it just because their bid was so high, it didn't warrant it uh, and was not the apparent low bidder. Um, in the bids themselves, we require that mobilization and demobilization be limited to 10% of the remaining bid items. That way, uh, we have some control on costs uh, and don't allow contracts or contractors to receive a significant portion of the total project cost up front before the project starts. Um, Effectively, what we do is eliminate our funding of their operation of the project. Um, we want them to be financially sound, stable enough to be able to bring in all the manpower and equipment that's necessary to do the job. Um, we want them to front the startup cost of the project because <coughs> it's, it's, it's their project. Um, Aztec Technologies didn't. Uh, comply with the requirement that it be 10 percent. Uh, they had, without writing the word exception, took an exception, I guess, to the 10 percent, crossed it off, and put in uh, about $194,000 in mobilization and demobilization. If you remove that from their total project, their 10 percent mold demo should have been about 33000 dollars 34000 And um, as it as it was, the uh, individual who dropped off the, uh, their, uh, their bid to the office made a comment of, about how much they had included in, generally, about how much they had included in for um, what they felt was necessary personnel safety and setup of equipment and, and other items, which, um, as it turns out, Atlantic testing either by virtue of its, the difference in its approach to completing the job um, or its comfort level in doing the work did not need to include that, the, okay. that amount of money. That was, that was a, the sig most significant portion. Uh, the most idea. of the other items actually were fairly similar. So in terms of actually coring and drilling, mm -hmm. um, installing some of the other equipment, the instrumentation, they were all fairly comparable, but uh, Aztec had about $160,000, $170,000 extra because they felt it was going to be a more difficult project than, than apparently Atlantic testing that. Uh, some of that might be also related to the equipment they're using. Uh, I think um, the, the drilling rig, if you will, and, and it's so small, I don't know if you can actually call it a rig uh, that Atlantic testing is, is proposing to use is one that can be broken down and carried in pieces out to the site, which I think is, is, a, is um, a big reason for their lower costs. They don't have to mobilize a bigger piece of equipment, bring it in, whether it be by barge or by crane. And uh, so I think that was the reason for the significant increase in their mold demold cost. So I suppose it could be argued they didn't comply with the bidding. You, you could, and, and, and in, in the, if it came down to it, yeah, yeah, we would have to correct that or they would have an option not to accept the corrected value mm -hmm. because it, it has to conform to that 10%. Um, yeah. We need a motion to accept Atlantic Testing's uh, bid for uh, contract uh, D012018. <laughs> I'll make that one. A second. I'll second that. Uh, any further discussion? Nope. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Resolution to revise the due process procedures for the access permit system of the <coughs> So this is really just the first chance that you guys get to look at this, what is what would essentially be a policy change. 
uh, <clears throat> it's guidance. Our, our policy is really our regulation. Uh, this is guidance as to how to administer that regulation. The, the thought that we want to kind of truncate the process and thereby reduce the number of touches that a uh, permit holder can have on an issue and, and get to a resolution quicker so that if you build a deck that's non-conforming, you talk to somebody in the office that gets appealed internally to staff, and then if you don't like that decision, it gets appealed up to the board. The board makes a decision, and we're out. We have, we have a, a final agency determination. In a relatively rapid process, um, not permitting somebody to get a number of months to do something with, with line staff and then line staff finally coming to the point where they say we need to do something and it goes to the administrator or uh, you know and another couple of weeks go by it gets to the chief engineer after several months, and then Rob turns it around quickly, and, and we have a decision. And then the person asked for more time to speak to the uh, executive director, which then turns into late September. And by the time we put it on the board calendar, it's January. The person asked for more time, it's March and now we're a year down the road and they haven't done a darn thing. And they know they haven't done a darn thing. And in the intervening months, they put the house in the market, they've sold it, and now we have a new person to deal with who goes, oh, I thought I had that big debt. And the whole thing starts over again. We want to get a process that is quicker, more nimble than that. Um, the initial draft was basically to uh, take the executive director out of the final step because he's really involved mm -hmm. all the way up through. Um, you know, he's sitting in the chair as the administrator and as the executive director at this point. But uh, even so, it's, it's the rare executive director who doesn't know what's going on in, in the Sacramento field office already. And, and is familiar with with the, the basic tenet of what staff are trying to to arrange. So uh, I have gotten a couple of comments. Uh, what with, from the fly the audience? Well, <laughs> there, there are there are some thoughts, and you know, speaking to what we should have, what we should define. Um, how we should spell out certain things, uh, whether we should identify consequences or remedies. Um, Can I, because I agree with absolutely everything you're saying. And in the same spirit, my concern was this last effort, this last uh, check right. doc issue. We got, we got to hear we got to the board, and we became kind of a, a mediating body. And I think that undermines a couple of things. First, it undermines procedure and process. But I think substantively what it does is undermines our staff. Because now all of a sudden, they're forced to come to a board meeting. And we've got the flip chart going and the drawings and making what becomes a decision that undermines our work. We're not arbiters. You know, our staff has worked hard, and either the person has complied or not complied, and they're coming here because they're going to be revoked or we're going to reverse. But then we're thrust in this position. Oh, and by the way, and it's also unfair to the permittee because if he or she wants to bring an Article 78 proceeding to challenge us, 
Well, we're now bound by having arbitrated the remedy. Okay, yep, we came to an agreement, you can do it this way. What happens if it doesn't, in fact, get done the way something has it What do we do? We're kind of oops, oops and goof. That was my concern. And that's the spirit in which I wanted some finality by staff who are the closest to it. And either you comply with our staff or you don't. And when you come to us, you know, all the, all the income free. You don't get to retry your case before the board. That's the spirit in which I just, even though it's guidance, I want us to have some guidance. We're not going to be around forever. Mm -hmm. Gets to us, you're done drawing maps and pictures and drawings and I'm going to do it by then. You had your chance. The, the process that we'd set up would have, and the way that we've tried to operate, is if somebody appeals the determination of the executive director to the board, the that person then needs to bring to the board their argument as to why their appeal should be uh, whether that upheld. decision should be overruled, whether, whether the decision should be overheld or upheld, okay. and and staff at the same time has to provide staff's position to the board exactly so that there's competing packets of material exactly. that the board gets 10 days before hopefully it actually is received 10 days before the board meeting in the same manner that your board packet is delivered to you well in advance <coughs> so you have an opportunity to understand what's before you once it gets to the board mm -hmm. Staff should be given five minutes, and the permittee exactly. should be given five minutes to articulate the basics of their argument, and then the board should make a decision, yay or nay. That was my thought and all along, and I thought we got to <coughs> by that guy. I think he knew the rules. And I'll be frank. I think this guy knew the rules, knew exactly what his responsibilities were, and he played his card perfectly. So we got thrust into a situation we should not have been. Right. And I don't even know if this guy has that look of Yes. He has. To your satisfaction, though. I'm not the physical okay. Myself. Worked out well that time. Yeah. But you shouldn't be put in that, and <coughs> you shouldn't be put in that situation to come here and negotiate a resolution in front of the board. I think that's unfair right. to the board, and more importantly, unfair to you guys. You're on the ground doing this. Yeah, that makes sense. You so. can't prescribe that and rule, that's got to be an understanding of the board. Basically. Okay. Um, I understand it's guidance, it's not the regulation. Correct. There can't be consequences for pursuing your right to appeal. No, I meant consequences that the decision is upheld or reversed. That's what I meant. The, the Finality permittee needs to, needs to know you had your day in court, so to speak, when you right. come here. And that's then we're, we're done with the final decision. And we that's on. what I meant. That's the okay. spirit in which I made that. Okay. Um, in any case, I, I think the resolution is is not yet right <clears throat> for your consideration. Uh, we as staff will go back and kind of massage it more, give you guys a chance to think about it at another couple of meetings. Uh, I don't know that there's any all fire rush to get it done. Uh, yeah, we don't have any pending cases. Right? Yeah, there's nothing really on the docket. Any alleged violators out there? <coughs> I haven't been in your area. Like, Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I would have reported them. <laughs> well, we heard last year there's violations all over the lake that we don't pick up on. And, and a lot of them, the encroachments that we find, with a letter from our office, and it's rectified, taken care of, right now. Very seldom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Who's the guy that we're going to meet with tomorrow? But it, it's in, yeah, it's kind of an issue out there right now. Uh, a piece of property that borders the district land and why he's paid for it all these years. And 
We're going there tomorrow. Um, well, the eligibility issue. Right. There's an uh, easement area there, so it's a complex situation that Mr. Leslie, Mr. Fulton, and myself, and Dan Fiscus will uh, meet with the committee tomorrow to see if we can do that. Okay. Make them happy. <laughs> All right, so no board um, actions is needed right now, so we move to C. Board resolution to amend contract C. 012012. The Hawkinsville Remediation, uh, Klein Schmidt Associates. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, the memorandum is on page 19, I believe. Um, again, a little. For the background on the project, the Hawkinsville Remediation, um, working on steadily in this phase uh, since 2013, Klein Schmidt has uh, been working on the remediation uh, plan for the project. Uh, we did complete, or Klein Schmidt did complete the, um, and by, uh, certain recommendations for necessary repairs to the dam back in 2014. Those uh, recommendations were forwarded in reports to the DEC, uh, Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, that preliminary and then final design um, uh, in short that, that design had some impact to wetlands. Um, Comments that we received both from the DEC and the Army, well, I, sh I should say just from the, uh, the, the Army Corps, um, uh, were, were related directly to the wetlands <coughs> and the impacts of the wetlands um, and would have led us, if, had we continued to pursue the, the, the footprint of the proposed project, uh, the need to complete a wetlands mitigation plan and uh, a rough probable cost to complete that plan would have been a minimum of $100,000. Um, the, the plan would have required potentially or, or at, as a minimum would have required um, some restoration of wetlands somewhere else, some compensation wetlands created, uh, further evaluation. So instead, uh, we uh, were looking at redesigning the earth and embankment to minimize that and avoid wetland impact such that the Army Corps would not require the mitigation plan. And uh, Kleinschmidt has provided a scope and fee to revise the design of the Hawkinsville Dam remediation uh, to include uh, changes to the outlet structure um, and the earth firm. Uh, the outlet structure changes came as a result of DEC comments the changes to the earth firm, as I just mentioned, were the result of comments received from Army Corps. And uh, the scope and fee would include additional work to revise the permit applications. Uh, there's a copy of their proposal attached to my memorandum. Kleinschmidt proposes to complete the redesign and address the DEC desired outlet changes and the redesign of their firm to avoid wetland mitigation for not to exceed price of $19,514. Staff recommends acceptance of Klein Schmidt's proposal, seeks forward authorization to amend the contract to include Amendment 3, Scope of Services, and seeks authorization for the interim, in, interim Executive Director to increase the contract price by $19,514. I'd be happy to take any questions. Mm -hmm. wow. Motion? I'll make that motion. Okay. It's only going to cost the board $19,000. Second? To avoid Carby Court. Yeah. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Uh, any opposed? No. Thank you. I got my one. I got my one into that. Staff and committee reports. General Counsel, Mr. Leslie. Uh, I'll try and keep my report brief. Uh, basically, as you heard extensively through the uh, public comment, in the waiting days of this year's legislative session, a bill affecting the regulating district, uh, Marchion and McDonald, 
Pass both houses. The bill for the become law would require the Reagan District to complete a comprehensive study regarding the beneficiaries of the district and any real property tax apportionment to establish a standard methodology for the determination of any future apportionment. Uh, the Reagan District to have to conduct a study and issue a report to the governor, the comptroller, and state legislative leaders by January 1 of 2020. Uh, I, I think. You know, at this point, we haven't taken a position on the bill, nor will we, uh, and uh, we'll move on and see what happens. Uh, as you said, I don't think there's a big fear that we're going to do what people are fearful we're going to do. Um, can that study be done in house, or is that have to be yes? Done? That can be done. It could be done in house, or we could spend an enormous amount of money and do it out. Or you just that. It's, it's very good. We could do it internally. Mm -hmm. We could. We've done it. Yeah, in that fact, was, we that, did it. That's what I was basically. We, we did it. Yeah. We did it and had it litigated up through the, you know, got an appellate division yeah, decision, which was blessed by the Court of Appeals, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then we used it again to do the Black River area uh, portion. When I looked it up, it was just a summary, and that's why I was <laughs> looked up the bill. Yeah, the, the two bills. All I saw was just a summary. Of it. Yeah. There's not a whole lot more to it. Yeah, there, there, is, there isn't yeah. any language I saw that says, thou shalt reapportion and increase permit fees. There is nothing to that effect. I think that would. We shall study right. shall. the apportionment, and whether the beneficiaries are the correct beneficiaries and what we ought to do with taxes. That's, that's it. If, yeah. it, if it's uh, if it's uh, signed by the governor, Ralph, what's the what's the time limit? The one thing that was true, if he doesn't sign it in the X number of days, it becomes so. Th the process for this going forward is that the the bill is passed, the assembly, then the senate sent back to the assembly. The assembly clerk is sitting on it, waiting to deliver it to the governor. They will deliver it to the governor when the governor asks for it. It'll be delivered with a number of bills of similar interest. Uh, the governor will have 10 days at that point to act on it, or it's automatically law. If he doesn't act on it, it automatically becomes law. Never in the history has that happened. Governor doesn't just forget that he called something up last Thursday and this Monday. He needs to <coughs> put something to paper and forgets to do it. He has a staff that does it. The it'll it'll get called up sometime between now and the end of the legislative session, which is technically going to be the last day they gavel out, December 31st of 2018. If they gavel out and this bill has not been called up, then the governor has 30 days to act on it. And if he fails to act on it, then it is vetoed. That is called a pocket veto. Also something that unless it is hugely controversial, the governor is not going to do. I expect sometime along the way, at the least an opportune time, or the most an opportune time, they will call it up. They will ask for our thoughts on it. They'll ask for thoughts from any other affected agency, whether that be DEC or the Department of State or, you know, Office of Mental Health and Retardation. I don't know. Somebody. The Comptroller and the, and the Attorney General, they'll get those opinions, they'll formulate their opinion, and they will issue a They'll either chapter the thing and sign it, or they'll issue a veto notice and not. Um, <clears throat> we'll have a little heads up as to when that's coming. Uh, if there's some gross deficiency in the bill that the governor thinks that they can fix, and the legislature happens to be back in session, they will tell the legislative leaders that it is their intention to sign the bill if certain things happen. 
that will mean a chapter amendment has to get passed through both houses of, houses of the legislature. And when that chapter amendment is delivered, then the governor will have the underlying bill delivered. The two things together will be chapter, so there'll be a chapter and immediate amendment, and the amendment then becomes the law. <coughs> I don't see that happening with this. Um, that said, I didn't see it passing in the first place. So, I, I, that's a long explanation. I understand. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was, that was a good one. Good. Good. It's good. Um, now, how, how, how does this pass 60 to 0 and the assembly to 0? The, the assembly and the Senate both have, operate under rules that allow the, the legislative leaders of those bodies to call for a vote and those senators or assemblymen who happen to be in the room vote before them. Those who are not in the room, I think, are given an opportunity to register with the clerk their opposition to a bill, but if they fail to do so, then everybody's vote, if it's not in the negative, is voted as in the affirmative. So... Can it be tied with a bunch of other stuff, too? Yeah. <laughs> no, no one is against. Everyone should pick up their dog food. Goes to right. that bill and oh, this one too is in. You know, you love the towel. And right, and it did. It happened on the last day of session. But they probably passed scores, dozens, yes. hundreds of bills without knowing what's in them. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I wouldn't profess that they don't know what's in them. They they the weren't government. controversial. They were at the end of the session, and this stuff got passed. And now the governor gets to start. So it's kind of sorted out. Yeah. Um, okay. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, there's no update regarding those claims filed by the Watertown firefighter or the final payment to Kingsbury at this point. So we're waiting. That's we just right. got the, the document we need. And uh, the land transfer from the Black River Area Environmental Improvement Association. I think it's actually the Black River Environmental Improvement Association. Um, to the regulating district for the parcel adjacent to Office of Dan has finally closed. Uh, the final site design plans are in development like plan shred, as Rob talked about. Uh, all secure the temporary revenue <coughs> permit through uh, DE fishing access site. Uh, once we get the design plans from Klein Schmidt, Rob will take care of Army Corps. Thank you. God bless you. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, my understanding is the, the lease at Suite 307 uh, has been finalized and sent back to the comptroller for approval. Other than that, any questions? No. Probably already asked you then. Okay, uh, compliance officer. Thank you. My report begins on page 24. We've had a few updates. Our fourth quarter MWBE and SDVOB reports have been accepted. Um, as the interim executive uh, director mentioned, I provided all training to staff, our annual training requirements. Um, the roof at Mayfield is going to be rebid. We had been in contact with a vendor that had issued a bid the last time around. They expressed interest in doing the project, but could not hold the price at the um, cost they had provided us. We could not accept a change in the original bid, so they bowed out, and I believe uh, it's now back in the hands of Rob and Mike, and we'll have to start the process um, from scratch. Okay, I'll ask the one too many questions. It was just a thought. We had an issue with the construction in the Watertown. I'm sorry, in the Lowville? No, in the Stillwater. I knew I'd get it right. And we did it in house. We can't do the roof in house. Okay. <coughs> we don't 
don't have the gas that Mayfield that could do the roof, and it's just not practical to bring the still water and have them live down here. Well, just a thought because yeah. it did a marvelous yeah. job. Yeah. Oh, I think it did a marvelous job. It's still I've only got two people in the room. Well, I have one right now full time. The other one starting Thursday. Uh, they'll probably take us. Two. Cool. Yeah. Just a thought. Yeah. As far as our new hires go, we did receive 22 applications for the maintenance specialist, so I did review those, and as um, Ms. Hodgson mentioned, we interviewed six and we did hire maintenance specialists. We have received eight applications for the engineering assistant. I reviewed those. I have scheduled interviews with three. Those interviews will be um, on Thursday, and Mr. Colton and Mr. Hodgson and myself will be uh, performing those interviews. As a reminder, on 25, 26, and 27 are the status sheets for the contract. Please be review those as they satisfy our public authority requirement under Section 2879. If you have any questions, if not, that completes my report. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Chief Fiscal Officer, Mr. Cora. Mr. Chairman, my report truncated. Can be found on pages 28 to 32. Uh, the reason for the short report is that uh, we continue, staff uh, continues to work on the year and closing activities for June 30th. Um, that will include some activities from the independent auditor who right now is being requested to uh, schedule I believe August 13th is the week they'll come in and do uh, the on-site audit. They haven't responded one way or the other yet, but I expect that to be the week. It will be in August. Um, the final approved budget uh, that, the, that the board adopted uh, last meeting has been posted on the district's website. Uh, under the New York State Administration the Public Authority Reporting System, the OSC budget request was posted on June 19th, and the next series of reports, which is the uh, the largest in the series of reports, having to do with the investment procurement, annual and independent audit reports, and data requests, uh, will be due on September 30th. That's my report. Are there any questions? Any questions? Is there any, any reason for the two bank statements, just for the credit card statements? We we have routinely put those in there. Okay. I find them to be wholly <coughs> useless, quite frankly. That's and actually, this was a probably there were members of the board, not any of this board, that had requested that be included in my report because it is, quote, the general board activity credit card. Uh, you have no interest in it, but certainly. I, I was just curious about the previous balance cancel bill. No, what's that? We, we never paid the same. Okay. Yes, so yes. Uh, 50. Probably would have included. Did it be 5 0? 5 0. I was just curious as to why the truncated report had just that at the end of it. 50? Yeah. 31. Oh, 31. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, different form. <laughs> it's a truncated copy you have there. What's that? This is on page 30. Right? It's always important to keep me <laughs> as truncated as possible. I'm just curious as to why that was on the report. <laughs> just that. You know, and, 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 and. Oh, we always have. Yeah. Any questions? I'm sorry. I'm, I, I'm good. That's just fine. No, I, what, I would, what I would recommend is. Probably the only thing I would think would be of interest to the board <coughs> might be the actual only the meeting activity, which this has some of that. I mean, you can see it has shows Hampton, the Hampton Inn, right. blah blah blah. But I mean, when you read it in the context of the actual credit card bill, it's that. I mean, look at it. You have to black a few things out. Oh, yeah. So we, we don't, can put right, it on. Don't want the credit. Just so we can post it and if right. see what happened to it. Right. Now. What I might do is just have just the continuation sheets that 
would be included with this bill that goes to the state controller, yeah. which then kind of tells you what the actual real activity is. I'd rather see that than this. Okay, we'll do that. Really? Okay, thanks. Yeah. That was just, just curious as to why it was there. Any uh, other questions? Comments? Chief mm -hmm. Engineer. Thank you. My report okay. begins on page 33. It was uh, rather dry in June. <laughs> Hudson River area at, at uh, Indian Lake and Mayfield had uh, 27 and 21 percent respectively uh, in precip. A little bit of anomaly at uh, Conklinville uh, at 78 percent of historic average generally speaking, it was just as dry, and that 78% really didn't help us out an awful lot at that one site anyway. Um, uh, so for the uh, month of June, we had about 28% uh, of our historic average inflow at Sockendale, 26% of historic average inflow at Indian Lake. Um, our releases were proportionately lower, too, than historic average um, for each site, trying to conserve as much water as we possibly could, making only the minimum releases that we needed to for river, uh, maintaining river flows and or uh, complying with um, minimum releases for um, augmentation and or recreational purposes like whitewater rafting. Black River area, fairly similar. Still water is 67 percent. Old Port to Sixth Lake at 30 and 45 percent of uh, historic average precip, respectively, <coughs> with uh, inflow to Stillwater at only 35 percent of historic average. And, and um, certainly, out of all our reservoirs, Stillwater is um, the lowest below below our target or historic average now at about two and a half feet as of today below our historic average, uh, certainly in, indicative of how dry it's been in the case of Stillwater going all the way back to the beginning of May when it really started to dry out. Um, and, that, and that you can see in our, our elevation graph on page, well, be the eighth page in on my report. Uh, uh, so it, it's the, it's not, certainly not been declared a drought, but it certainly is dry enough to impact uh, our inflows uh, pretty significantly, at least some of the studies. We're about a foot and, and eight-tenths below our target elevation at Sakandaga, although because of the offer of settlement, uh, elevation being significantly higher throughout the summer than historic mm -hmm. average, as it turns out, Sakandaga is at historic average. So. I haven't had any one. calls from folks at, around yeah. Sakandaga, and it's probably because if they wow. think in terms of historic average, it's right where it has been for you the last calls? 30 or 40 years. No calls at all from them. No, no. So, uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm surprised. Yeah, yeah. I'm surprised. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's certainly lower than it has been in more recent years, yeah. and lower <laughs> than where it is if we're on target in terms of the offer of settlement. But uh, I do think people understand and make the connection. Geez, no rain. Right, right. The lake yeah. as well. Yep. Yeah. And the deficit isn't quite as bad at Indian Lake. We're about seven tenths below our historic average in Old Fort and Sixth Lake, although it took uh, a little bit of time to get both of those uh, back to, uh, you know, through the refilling and back to their normal summertime elevations. Uh, sometime around the end of June, we 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 finally reached it at uh, Old Forge, probably one of the latest uh, fill dates uh, that I can recall in the almost 20 years that I've been with the district. Um, but uh, now it's just a matter of making minimum releases at those two facilities to maintain the average summer elevation. And uh, hopefully it doesn't get too much drier. August is usually a really dry month. The precip we received in June was uh, consistent with the deficit you might see in August. So it may get so far significantly drier, drier if we get typical August weather. So, uh, but we'll continue to.
save as much as we can and release that which, which we need to and, and, and balance all the interests as we always have. So, um, if you happy to take any questions on operation if you have them. Uh, is the wastewater disinfection mandates, is that going to affect our flows at all? Or? Um, I don't believe so. I haven't received any calls. No one has had any concerns about river flows. And um, well, I, the Auburn Settlement itself is, at least in the Hudson area, addresses that. You know, and, and so the minimum releases that we make and the minimum flow below the confluence is sufficient for the the, the base flows that are needed for um, any kind of consumption or or waste water some way. They're all they're all going to be disinfected. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Any questions, comments? No, I want to thank him for filling the Fulton chain. I didn't get any phone calls on it. Good. My house <laughs> phone is ringing off the hook. Because uh, you've changed it to an unlisted phone number. I did change companies. Phone entirely. Chief Administrator, Mr. Hyde. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My report starts on page 67. Uh, a reoccurring issue over to the Sport Island Pub Beach has raised its ugly head again. Uh, the Department of Health has closed down the beach area at the Sport Island Pub not allowing public swimming for the owners of the pub uh, receive the proper permits from the Department of Health. <coughs> I'll give you a brief uh, idea of what, what goes on over there. It, it's a unique area on the lake where the Sport Island Pub is assigned the access permit. <coughs> and from a result of the lawsuit, the mm. court order names some of the properties in the park that originally belonged, belonged to the old FJ and G Railroad, the right to use the Fort Island Park permit area. The regulation district issues dating these permits to those property owners that have that FJ and G Railroad clause in their deeds. Is that special category of permits? It is. I mean, it had to be. Created because of litigation. Right. Interesting. Yes. The problem is that a lot of people use that area that are not, are neither nor, are neither the Sport Island Pub patrons nor bathing permit, bathing beach permit holders. The DOH has no authority over the bathing beach permit holders as an association. Only public swimming by the patrons of the pub. So until the pub has the proper permit from DOH, they are required to have several signs, which are in place, stating that no public swimming, uh, and that they patrol the area, asking anyone not having a bathing permit, permit to stay out of the water, which they are doing. Uh, so it's, it's pretty ugly over there. Uh, we now have cameras at Six Lake Dam in Indian Lake. And we're working eventually having one at the enclosure. We attended a first inspection at the Stillwater Dam, which went very well. I haven't seen the final report yet, but I think the only issue uh, that they wanted to see some of the brush removed. And that was about it. they got to find something. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll deal with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's all. Uh, the guys do a great job up there with maintenance, preventing maintenance. Engineering staff also. Uh, let's see an update on the work boat. An outside contractor, Milton Cat, uh, has actually removed the Princess loader off the boat and is installing new bushings uh, in the Princess loader as we speak. I'm hoping this work will be completed today. All the work is being done over at Miller's Grand View Marina. We have an area over there where we load riprap onto the boat and taking place of that area gave us great access to get the crane and, um, and contractor's truck in there to remove the Prentice loader off, replace the bushings and get it back in. Is that what all those stones are? The clear picnic area? Yes. That's our loading area for the work boat. Someone asked me, is that a, a new ramp? No. I said, if that's a ramp, that's pretty darn steep. No. 
Any questions or comments? No. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, any other board member questions or comments from the floor here? Then we need a resolution for our next board meeting, September 13th. There's no August meeting uh, in Lauda. I'll make that motion. A second. Is there a second? A second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.